Hello again, welcome back to the ninth Faster Project webinar panel session. This time we're going to be looking about accessibility and inclusivity when it comes to EV charging infrastructure. We've got some brilliant panelists lined up for you, but as always, let's have a quick update on the latest progress with the Faster Project. So we'll welcome Donald Monaghan and Gemma Robinson from Hytrans, who is also involved in the Faster Project, to talk a wee bit about the latest progress. Thanks, Ewan. Um, good evening, everyone. Uh, it's great to see you all here this evening. Um, it's good to see so many of you on such a wet, miserable night, um, as it is here in Northern Ireland anyway. Um, and if it's still appropriate to say, just to wish you all a very happy new year and a very healthy and prosperous 2023. Um, so, yeah, it's been a busy, busy few weeks uh, yet again for the FASTER project. Um, you may have seen over the past few days, we've actually just announced the provisional site locations uh, for each of the three regions. So in Northern Ireland, Scotland and the Republic of Ireland. So there's been quite a lot of interest around those over the past few days. Uh, so it's good to show that we are making uh, that progress with the project and uh, we look forward to having the infrastructure rolled out um, over, the, over the coming months. In terms of some of the work that I've been doing at Southwest College over the last uh, while, um, I've been sort of working through plans for 2023 um, in terms of um, what events we might be running, uh, some schools projects that we'll also be looking at um, to further increase awareness of both the FASTER project and also then electric vehicles with younger audiences. And um, we also are planning the next series of our EV talk films. And um, so very much looking forward to producing those. And I would say if any of you out there have particular vehicles that you would be interested in seeing uh, reviewed as part of those films, you know, we're always happy to take your suggestions and thoughts. And um, if there are if there are vehicles that you that you would like us to review, um, please do let us know. Um, also, we will be planning out a further series of the webinars for the rest of 2023. And again, if there's any topics or subjects that you'd like to see it, see us cover in these sessions, um, do do get in touch with us and let us know, even if it's something that we've uh, covered in the past. And you feel that we could we could cover it again and that it would be beneficial. And um, we're more than happy to do that. Um, I'm going to hand over quickly now to Gemma. Um, and Gemma can give you a little bit of an overview of the work that she's been doing at Hytrans for the project. Good evening, everyone. Thanks so much for joining tonight. Um, so within Scotland, um, Hytrans um, stands for the Highlands and Islands Transport Partnership, and we are leading on the procurement within the project. So we have just um, been through the procurement process and chosen a supplier. Um, I can't announce who that is at the moment because we've not yet um, signed contracts, um, but we're very close to being able to announce that. Um, we've also just accepted quite a lot of our um, quotes with um, the DNO, which is SSE in Scotland, um, which means that we can start to plan when the works happen in the ground, which is, I'm sure, a lot of you want to hear about. Um, and finally, we've been liaising with um, quite a few private landowners on this project, um, and the legal agreements are almost in place as well. So there's a lot of coordinating to do um, to get works on site to happen as efficiently as possible to to minimize disruption for everybody. Um, I'm back a little bit later on in the webinar um, to discuss what we've done on accessibility. So I will leave it there just for now. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Donald and Gemma. Um, so, yeah, I, I should point out as well that we have our Q&A at the end of this session. Uh, there is a, a set, well, obviously there's the chats, which many of you have found so far. Um, and do feel free to, to be part of the, the kind of debate in the chat. But if you have any questions that you'd like to put to us and to, to the panellists this evening, then 
please do use the Q&A function and we will make sure that we can get through as many of those questions of yours as we can. Um, so welcome to all of our panellists. Uh, we've got a, a star-studded lineup as always this evening. We have Raki Jain from Motability, Kate Tyrrell from ChargeSafe, Ryan Robertson from East Lothian Council. We have Claire Pennington from Urban Foresight, uh, Heather Kennedy from Scottish EV Drivers Club, Ian Johnston from Osprey and Gemma, of course, who you've just met from High Trans. So welcome, everybody. Cameras on, mics on, and we can begin. So first item on today's agenda, of course, uh, covering the, 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 the main reasons why we're here. So when it comes to accessibility and inclusivity, what does it really mean and why is it so important? And I want to start at this accessibility from a safety perspective. So it would obviously be uh, rude of me not to bring in at this point, Kate Tyrrell from Charge Safe. So safety within charging as an accessibility and inclusivity perspective, uh, what is it and why is it important? So safety in line with accessibility is important from uh, the perspective of if it's quite dark or you're not able to, to reach the charge point, are you having to navigate additional obstacles in order to get to the charger to plug in and get back into your car? Anything that's going to make the plug-in process a little more difficult, which means you're spending more time outside of your car, if it's dark, if it's in a, um, you know, a, a challenging area um, that could present some, uh, some risk then you don't want to be outside of your car any longer than you need to be, um, especially if it's late and you're on your own. Um, so accessibility becomes quite important there. There's also the actual uh, safety safety. So there's, you know, personal safety or there's tripping over and hurting yourself and potentially, you know, breaking, uh, breaking a hip. I'm going, <laughs> I'm just assuming someone's going to break their hip. I broke my hand a year ago, literally tripping over my own feet um, and it was completely sober. And during the middle of the day, it does happen. Um, but if you were to cause yourself an injury like that so by tripping over um, extra long cables that are just trailing along the floor, um, that could be problematic if you're unable to get help for yourself. So having that driver visibility, pulling back on the challenges of getting from the car to the charger is, is really important, even for able-bodied people, um, less alone those who have additional challenges in, in accessing charge points. That's a very valid point. And in terms of those additional challenges, that brings us neatly on to accessibility and inclusivity from a mobility perspective. So, Raki, if you can give us a, a high level overview, of course, we'll be delving into this in a lot more detail throughout the, the webinar. But the key the key kind of points that we must consider here for, from a, an inclusivity perspective, why is this important? What are the main challenges for mobility with charging? Thanks, Ian. Um... I work for Motability Operations, which um, helps disabled customers get onto a lease for a car. And uh, for us, that's really, really critical for people with mobility issues uh, to be able to use the EV uh, charging uh, stations um, just, uh, you know, easily. Just like Kate said, um, safety is an aspect. Accessibility is a really, really big aspect of it you know, the population which has some kind of disability is large and we really need to cater for them. Uh, the space around the car, the charging point itself, uh, the display on the charging point, the dis distance from the, the charging point to the, to the car, um, all those need to be really uh, kept in mind for these people to make it easier for them to just access it. Uh, this is from a disability point of view, but you know, if you think about inclusivity, think about a, a, a parent with a child or somebody who's, you know, who's not tall, who's not sort of strong enough to carry those cables, pull those cables, plug them in. Uh, you have to think about all of those aspects. And, and that's really uh, what we're keen to do to make sure they all become accessible, the charging points become more accessible. You make some really good points there, actually, because for EV drivers who've been at this for a while and um, you know don't have any mobility issues, don't have any um, concerns about kind of driving at night and so on, this can just easily kind of fly over the, the, the top of your head in terms of, of um, 
you're just thinking about the necessity of this that can be a huge stumbling block. Um, I've just realised before we continue, we appear to have two Claire Penningtons and one of them is is talking away <laughs> um, uh, without a camera on. Uh, I think possibly it's a phone that's gone for a ride in a car somewhere. Um, yeah. Has anyone else noticed that? Let's see if we can uh, try and... Uh, I'll, Donald, I'll see if you can remove the, the imposter Claire. <laughs> I was just there was some background noise whilst whilst Racky was talking. It's definitely um, not me. Yeah, yeah, that's so bizarre. What is this? Um, yeah, uh, Donald, if you can kindly remove uh, the the <laughs> the clear without a camera. Way hey, there we go. Yeah, that was quite bizarre. I could definitely hear sort of like Tesla uh, indicator noises and stuff there. That was bizarre. Anyway, right. So. Um, I suppose now we can we can delve into this and if we go back to safety first and foremost you know if you are um you know a, a fairly kind of burly guy and you're driving on your own you might not be too worried about a very sort of dimly lit corner of a car park for for charging a car but when it comes to the the kind of personal safety perspective I mean, Kate, would you say the existing EV infrastructure locations um, like are, are unanimously safe, or are unanimously unsafe, or are there definitely a kind of mix in there? What's the what's the overall state of play at the moment in Scotland, or, or the wider UK, and of course Ireland as well? So I've got some controversial data um, that we uh, put out as a press release at the beginning of the week and it, it attracted some rather salacious headlines by some very eager journalists wanting to shoot down the EV industry. Um, but just to be absolutely clear, this is the result of us uh, going out and inspecting sites using a 144 point inspection plan um, as independent uh, inspectors. So it's it's very much a how does this site score against this, this and this measure? It's not something that we've just gone, oh, this is this is what we think. So I can bring you some statistics of a sample size of 817 inspections that have been carried out owed to no particular network operator, no uh, geographical location. It is a pure sample from all the way across the UK and Wales and Scotland, um, not Ireland, unfortunately. That is the one place that we haven't been able to reach into just yet. Uh, 817 inspections, 87% of that have what we would deem as insufficient lighting. When we say insufficient lighting, what we mean is that there's not a, a light, uh, a light directly over the charge point and within the, the local vicinity. So it must be, to get the five stars, it must have a light over the charge point and um, within that locality. So that's 87%. It could be that they scored a four star or a three star in that there's lighting nearby, but not directly over. 77% of those sites do not have a security camera directly covering the charge point. So there could be a camera nearby that's not pointed towards the charge, the charging location. Um, that's quite important as well. So I think when we're talking about safety for us, the two major things are, is it sufficiently lit? Does it have a security camera there to protect the driver, um, to deter localized crime? And, um, and also to protect the assets. So as I'm sure Ian would tell you, uh, the cables are very expensive. The units are, you know, it's a costly process to install infrastructure. So we'd like to see that that's protected too. Um, so yeah, that's, that's what we've found so far. Um, I would say it's improving. Definitely the legacy sites are the issue here. <clears throat> And we know why we understand that, you know, um, it's not down to the charge point network operators exactly. It could be down to the uh, the district ne uh, network operator. It could be getting the grid connection in the right place, getting the correct planning permission, having the right equipment, the landowner allowing extra space and time to to do these builds in the right way. Um, so there is work to be done. But I do think that we're seeing an upward trend of network operators coming on board and saying, okay, how do we make our sites more worthy for our, our, our customer safety and accessibility needs? Very promising to hear. And on that note, you're saying obviously about legacy sites being a main issue. Um, how many of these uh, legacy sites have you seen where following the the rating from ChargeSafe? In fact, actually, kind of jumping ahead of myself, if we if we give a, a very quick sort of um, elevator pitch on exactly sort of ChargeSafe's 
kind of operations obviously you've alluded to a lot of it but um yeah i mean in terms of who charge safe are and, and and what you do and who you work with etc then my follow-on question for that is how many of these <clears throat> legacy sites um have you worked with where there has been a demonstrable improvement in safety uh, as a result of these engagements um even with more kind of challenging layouts prior to the you know to your uh, intervention so the uk average score is 2.56 which leaves a lot of room for improvement. The difference between the legacy sites whereby we've been unable to get the network operator to want to work with us, who can benefit from the data that we can provide that shows them a breakdown of what's going on, conscious of how they can make these improvements or uh, you know, just, just offering good service um, versus the networks that do work with us is, is vastly different. So. You've got Ian with Osprey, um, Fastnet have come on board, 3TI, all with largely just open ears saying, please give us this information, show us where our opportunities are, show us where we've got potential threats in place, and then we can source solutions. And if we can implement them, we will, but we will at least be aware of it and, and you know we know how to fix that. So that's really important. There are much larger networks out there who have um, actually really come a long way in terms of their uh, their sites. So um, one of the oil and gas companies has got a, a really lovely accessible design uh, that's being rolled out in a lot of their new installs. It then comes down to reliability. So how safe is the charger that you can't actually use um, then becomes the question. And they seem to put their fingers in their ears and they, and they don't really want to deal with that. So I think there's a real ownership on networks to embrace the information that we can provide and to see it as more of a an operational arm to their business rather than a marketing tool. Um, and also, we're not beating everybody over the head. We're saying that this is this is what you could do to increase your score and, and this is how you can um, help to get your competitors, customers <laughs> over to you across the road, you know. Fair point. And in terms of those those charging networks and those charging infrastructure owners, because as we've discussed previously on these faster project webinars, there are some um, some examples of charging infrastructure where the hardware is owned by the charging network. For example, Osprey. We will be featuring Ian later on talking about examples of uh, of accessible design, of course. And there are some examples where the charging network is separate from the owner of the hardware. For example, Ryan Robertson from East Lothian Council. You own hardware that is operated by Charge Place Scotland. Uh, and again, we'll be looking at uh, how you've been uh, you know working on accessibility at your sites as well well later on but before uh, we let these two sing their praises um you know just between you me and the audience because you know ian and, and, and ryan they're not listening just now who are the best examples who are the who are the examples of best practice when it comes to safe design of charging infrastructure at the moment and why why are they those ones the best examples so i've got my top three sites and this is all bearing in mind that i haven't seen and i don't believe it's live yet but I've heard that someone has gone and acquired their first plot of land and has decided that they're going to do exactly what they want with it, which is really, really exciting. And I cannot wait to get down there. So Ian, send me an invite when it's live. Um, otherwise, my top sites are the Paisley Pear site. Um, that was rolled out by Osprey. Um, Masters have given them extra room to play with, which is just a really wonderful display of how um, you know, partnerships with, with your landowners can work to your benefit. If you have a conversation with them, set those expectations, show them why it's important, they will um, eventually <laughs> say, yeah, okay, you can have the extra land. So that one for accessibility is just outstanding. Um, we've got the Norwich Forecourt from GridServe that opened last April. That is such a shining example for um, safety, but also uh, driver awareness and, and learning and just creating these educational opportunities within their community, you know, outside of safety and accessibility. I think it really has to be um, positioned as, as one of the top ones for all of that it's doing for its localised community, as well as the safety and the accessibility, because they have got super wide charging bays or with um, the, the components are much lower on the charge point with the bollards slightly out to the side of each uh, each charging unit so 
they've done a smashing job. Um, and Hamilton, so there's a Fastnet in Hamilton. Um, that's what I had the pleasure of visiting recently. And the reason why uh, I, I really love this site, and I wish I could cut down the trees and the bushes that, that cover it up and make it less visible from the roadside because that was the only thing that upset me, is how well this is. It's got that huge canopy over the top of it. It really is unmistakable. Um, you, you can see it from the roadside with the, it's kind of like seeing the yellow arches, isn't it? You, you can see it. Um, they have got their, their drive-in bays, so your, your bay parking, but then right on the end, they've got a drive-through bay, which is exciting for accessibility. Um, whilst the other bays could be better, and there are um, curbs there to negotiate for disabled people, um, and even people with uh, children in, in small push chairs and, and such. The bay on the end being a drive through is important for a couple of reasons. That's for accessibility, for any modified vehicles that have been supplied by mobility operations where they might have to exit the vehicle from the back of it, um, requiring a ramp and they can't be steep ramps, they, they have to be long ramps so that you know, somebody doesn't topple out of the back of the vehicle um, and also commercial vehicles, which is a consideration that we now must look forward to to including. Um, so those are my top three sites. And just very quickly, I do want to give a massive shout out to Easy Charge. Um, Philip Shadbolt and his team down in Oxfordshire have done a really sweet job. I call them sweet because they're shorter units. They look really cute. They've got fun uh, branding around them but all of the components are much lower more accessible especially from uh, a seated height uh, they've really taken that consideration and they've been doing this before we've even been inspecting charge points so um, they're on to a good thing and, and I look forward to seeing what else they, they bring up. That is a superb summary thank you Kate. Um, I reckon it's time for our first poll of the evening then Donald if we could uh, flash that up on the screen please. Um, so Basically, it's, it's a simple question. Have you ever felt unsafe when using a charge point? Uh, yes or no. So um, it would be interesting if you have felt unsafe, uh, if you could explain in the chat uh, the, the reasons why, actually. So we'll just let, um, let everyone uh, answer that poll. And whilst that's uh, coming through, couple of quick points. Peter McCree has an excellent question. Uh, you were saying, Kate, about the score of 2.6. Is that the average score out of 10, out of 5, out of... I did, I did see that pop up yeah. and I'm sorry for not being clear. It's out of five stars. So it's not it's not as bad as out of 10. It's out of five. But we really want to see the UK average being at least 3.5. Kind of like your health hygiene rating when you're looking at a restaurant. We need that three uh, to, to be the minimum standard in the UK. Good stuff. And um, yeah, yeah, I agree on that. And just whilst we're waiting on the, the poll results, Donald, you appear to be um, in control of that. Uh, I don't have control of the poll for once. Oh, there we go. So um, yeah, about a quarter of us have felt unsafe whilst using a charge point. And uh, yeah, so Neville, uh, Neville, is that Armstrong? So, yeah, Google, uh, sorry, Google, Zoom loves cutting off people's names. Um, but yeah, uh, Trory outside Enniskillen at 10.30 p.m. Donald, that'll be a local one to you. So you'll be able to uh, divulge more info on on the the the, the localities of that one. Um, but yeah, thanks for the, the feedback on that. Um, before we, we move on, very quickly, actually, talking about the accessibility of the Norwich site for GridServe. Am I right in saying that, so the original Braintree site had these pass either side bays, and I'm kind of stealing Ryan's thunder here because that was one of the brilliant things about what he's done with his flagship site that we'll talk about later on. But am I right in saying that the Norwich site is all nose-in bays that are car-sized as opposed to having longer bays for vehicles that are towing or people who, uh, well, like even like HGVs and, and buses, there's the kind of vehicular accessibility, let alone the uh, the accessibility accessibility of the individual. Uh, do you have any info on that one at all? Does anyone know if there's any long bays at Norwich? Grid so from what I can remember from the tour that we got from uh, Sam and Toddington when it launched was that everything's nose in but they mm. do have the capacity and the space to then introduce the longer bays. Um, I think there was something to do with the battery as well that they've got to put in and uh, so correct me if I'm wrong I believe that it's not there right now, but it can be there later. 
I'm very pleased to hear that because I thought, you know, that was um, almost a, a kind of retrograde step at an otherwise fantastic site. So I'm very pleased to hear that that has been included or sorry, you know, that there's passive provision for it. So it will be included later on. Um, so actually, we've we've had all of this from the, uh, you know, from obviously the, the pros. But when it comes to um, the representative of the everyday EV driver, Heather, I'm really keen to get your feedback when it comes to safety, because obviously we've just had a look at the, uh, the poll results there. A quarter of people have had concerns is about at least one particular charge point. Um, obviously, you're one of the moderators and uh, well, the founder of the Scottish EV Drivers Club. What are the, the, the biggest concerns that you've seen from EV drivers regarding safety uh, from an accessibility perspective? Uh, and uh, you know, what are the, the big things that need to change? Yeah, I would say um, most people do complain about the lack of lightning. I speak from experience myself. Um, I think one time the Riverside Museum up in Glasgow is the worst that I've ever been to. Um, just charging at night, there's nothing round about you at all. There's very little lighting. Um, so that is the one thing I would say that definitely needs improved in a lot of the areas. Um, Certainly, there's, there's places you've got like the solar panels and things at the Ayrshire Athletics Arena that's got the light underneath and things like that, um, which is great, but it's still quite a remote sort of site. If you wanted to leave your car there and then walk away at night, you know, it's, it's quite rem remote. There's no facilities nearby or anything like that for, um, for visitors to use, so... Good point. And actually, you've, you've just put me in mind of uh, there was a particular charge point in Milton Keynes. So um, back when before fully charged live outgrew the, the flipping home of the British Grand Prix at Silverstone, it takes some effort to have an event that outgrows a massive racing circuit and has to move to an airport. But um, it used to be held at, at Silverstone. And, um, you know, so Milton Keynes was where everyone would, would get a hotel because it was the nearest kind of place. So I was on the, my hotel was on the kind of main drag, um, like, uh, I was going to say Sunset Boulevard. It's, it's literally called something along like that, Midsummer Boulevard or something. Anyway, um, yeah, there's quite a lot of charge points in Milton Keynes. Not all of them work, but uh, I've eventually found one that did. And it was kind of round the block, round the back of another building in this vast empty car park. And that's where I felt safety concerns, not so much for me, but for leaving my car overnight in case anyone went, oh, that's one of these newfangled ones. Let's make life difficult for them and slash the tires or something stupid. Like, I just get paranoid. But no, totally uh, having that surveillance, having that lighting, having that, that kind of neighborhood watch almost of having you know eyes on is so crucial because if it had been parked round on the other side, then there would have been a lot more people, but that would inherently have had that sense of, of neighborhood watch about it. You know, there'd be less chance of anyone doing anything silly. So yeah, no, it's really interesting to get this feedback and to see that there's people um, actually very similar to what Scott's, uh, Scott McDonald's just uh, mentioned about Riverside. Local yobs racing around the Riverside car park, wheel spins and drifting, not the most attractive sites. Um, I, I agree on that. Uh, it seems to be that, however, if you follow a taxi driver in, one of the electric taxi drivers, they don't take any nonsense. And that's why Dundee's charging hubs are so well uh, looked after, because if any Yobo has tried anything at those charging hubs, the taxi drivers would tear into them um, like, a, like a tin of beans, you know, because that's basically their livelihood to be able to charge that car and they will not take any nonsense. So um, anyway, yeah, I suppose the, the next point is uh, the, from a, mo a mobility perspective. And before we bring in Raki, um, we may as well stick with with yourself, Heather, because we do have uh, some members of Scottish EV Drivers Club and indeed um, uh, EV a and I and, and uh, Irish EV Owners Association and EVA England um, who do have uh, mobility issues. And they will occasionally mention this within the forums and so on. And it's, it's very valid points. Generally, whenever new hardware was installed um, in recent years that didn't have some sort of accessibility consideration, this would be one of the first things that would be mentioned as a negative on the uh, on the, 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 the forums, wasn't it? So, um, you know, what have you found, Heather, has been the general um, kind of feedback, I suppose, from our members of the Scottish EV Drivers Club who have limited mobility about the state of play at the moment and the biggest challenges they face? Yeah, I mean, to be honest, I think the, the feedback I'm getting is that still some of the new sites that's coming on are still not accessible. So things like you've, you've not got some drop curbs. So, you know, we might go up to a charge point and there's a curb there. 
and you can go up and reach the cable. But for them in the wheelchair, they've, they've not got a ramp to get up on. Then you've got the metal poles that's in the road as well. I mean, even, even myself getting access, you're trying to run around the pole, pull the cable around the pole. <laughs> um, so yeah, the metal barriers are a pain. So like Kate was mentioning earlier, even if they could just move them slightly over just to make the access a bit easier. And then in some places, do you actually need those metal poles? Some of them have got the bump stops. You can't actually get a wheelchair even in between the bump stops between the bays. Um, the other thing that personally myself I found as well, um, I broke my shoulder in September. So I, I'm recovering from that. But when I started driving again, I'm still finding it hard to lift the cables. <laughs> They're so heavy. Yeah, so things like that. Um, the other thing was the, the, the solar panel coverings. Um, some of the sites have been built and it's been too low for, for some of the commercial vehicles to charge. So that's one of the other sort of things as well. Um, but yeah, so back and room between bays as well. I mean, I struggle to get out some, sometimes. Some of the bays are so tight. Um, and that's, you know, even just a normal bay, sometimes they're not wide enough. So. So things like that really needs to be brought into consideration. But yeah, that is the feedback we're sort of getting. It's still even new sites. There's still things they're not thinking about. Um, been, yeah, fantastic points, actually, because, of course, we're both uh, both originally slash still from East Ayrshire, where uh, the Ayrshire Athletics Arena Charging Hub was built a few years ago, and it was considered flagship at the time. But that's one of the ones where the solar canopies are so low down mm -hmm. that if you have like a, a, a Maxxis E-Deliver 9, you know, kind of high roof fan, that's one of the ones you can't get in because it's, um, you know, the by the time the cable reaches from the rapid charger, you know, it doesn't have that reach as far as the van can actually nose in before it would kind of... Uh, mm -hmm you know, scrape itself off the, the underside of the array. Plus those bays are quite narrow. All of those things that you just mentioned, it's, it's very much legacy thinking that was important for cars, but we now need for able-bodied people, but we now need to be looking at, um, you know, all of the different vehicles that are going electric and all of the different drivers who are switching to electric. And yeah, you, you've raised some fantastic points there. Um, but looking uh, strictly at kind of mobility, uh, very quickly before we bring, we bring in yourself, Raki, if we can have the second poll of the evening, please which is, have you ever been physically unable to use a charge point? Now, obviously, Heather, you've just uh, alluded to that very point. Um, and whilst Donal is bringing up this poll, uh, I have a quick uh, anecdote for you. Um, there are some new charge points I've seen in Scotland where uh, you know, they've literally just been brand new installed, where um, you, you you swipe your RFID card and you go to remove the the plug from the holster of this rapid charger, and you know the, the light says, "Yep, you know you can take this now," and you try taking it. And I am an able-bodied person, and it feels as if it's still locked in place. No, it's just that the holster is so stiff that it should never have left the factory like that, and it should never have been signed off on commissioning like that. Because if you have limited mobility, there is not a snowball in hell's chance that you'd be able to use that charger. Um, so. I a, a crucial bit of feedback to, um, you know, obviously to to the faster project is uh, when these sites are being commissioned, if they are the kind of chargers that lock the cables into their holsters, as opposed to having a little kind of loose tray that you sit them in, or if you're sort of dangling down on some sort of cable tidy system, grease the holsters, make sure that someone with comparatively um, kind of weak upper body strength or, or or limitations in the use of their arms is able to actually lift that plug out of the holster when the unit is activated because otherwise that is one of the most demeaning things to you know to to be this away from being able to use it technically able to but it's because it's just not being commissioned for anyone apart from like Britain's strongest man. Um, so yeah, if we can have a look at the results, please now, Donald. I've, I've hopefully kind of ranted on long enough to, to get a, a decent amount of feedback on the uh, oh there we go. I'm actually interested to see that so uh, about 60 percent of us have not been physically unable to use a charge point but um you know there's some of us who've had issues with clearance between adjacent parked cars to allow access precisely what you said heather i would imagine that some of that will be due to very bad parking by cars in adjacent bays i've seen that before particularly at rapid chargers but also some bays are just straight up too narrow um and then yeah cable reach issues and so on um but Obviously, you know there there is. I mean, there are there are numerous kind of accessibility issues that are more to do with the the kind of mobility requirements of the individual. But this has been interesting to see. And on that note, uh, I'd love to bring in Raki from Motability. So, 
Would you say that existing public charging infrastructure locations are broadly accessible from a mobility perspective? <laughs> no. <laughs> Sorry, that was very blunt. Um, no, I think they're getting there, Ewan. Um, and there's a lot of awareness about them being accessible. A lot of charge point providers are reaching out to us and more to Mobility the Charity to try and understand how they can make it more accessible. Uh, there are standards with the charities come out with um, with uh, BSI and they're out, out in the public arena for people to use, for charge point providers to use and charge point networks to use uh, to make sure they are, you know, they are creating accessible um, char charging uh, stations and charging uh, uh, units. Uh, no, they aren't. Uh, there's a lot of things which need to be considered because it's not like an ice vehicle fuel charge where you go, you you need five minutes. Even if you're uncomfortable, you can manage that five minutes. You know, you got you got to think about the wait time, which requires accessible toilets, like Heather mentioned, accessible facilities around, which are needed sometimes. Even basic things like if you're sitting in your car and you're charging, um, can they see what? Or how much the car is charged you know sometimes your app is not doing that you want to see it on the display um can you see it while you're sitting in the car or do they have to physically get out and then check again um so there's a lot of things for for it to be accessible for individuals who have disabilities let alone for people who don't have disabilities also have issues um you know heather heather alluded to the cable uh cable and uh, the length of the cable is really really important because these are really heavy cables they don't really turn bend easily uh, you can't really plug them in um, the time it takes for that cable to plug in and you've tapped your card uh, is also a big issue we've had customers who've been uh, charged like three or four times pre-authorization uh, just because they've tapped by the time they get to the car and start the charge because the, every every charge point is different on how they charge. Um, they've been pre-authorized with a forty pound uh, amount, and you know it does come back, but you're out of pocket for that week or four days, or depending on the provider. So there's a lot of things which which need to be talked through in terms of accessibility, uh, which isn't there, but there's a lot coming. Uh, but there's a lot of awareness around it. Even help at sites. I know it's not possible at every site, but there are there is an app now which allows you to get help. And it, as long as charge point providers are connected to it, you can get help. It's not it's not it's not instant, but it's there if you need it. So yeah, it's happening. Yeah, you've actually there's there's three particularly uh, important points that uh, that were raised there actually. So one of them you were you were talking about the new standards that have been released to do with accessible charging infrastructure. Um, I believe that Motability has been heavily involved in the the creation of at least one of these standards. Um, so the the kind of key points of those standards are they more focused on the physical charging infrastructure itself, you know, the actual charge point slash charger or the way that it's actually installed. So, for example, um, drop curbs or no curbs or, you know, bump stops being a, a, a possible so, yeah, restriction. Yeah, and so they on. Cover, cover both. You know, um, as long as it's physical, they cover both. But there's more focus on the physical side of it. Uh, but it covers both elements. Superb. And in terms of the availability of that documentation, so I can share that with yeah, you. Yeah, please do. Yeah, please do in the chat um, when you get a chance. Actually, um, and in fact, uh, oh, Gemma has, has asked a very good question in the in the chat. Um, actually, there is the, the Q and A as well. So uh, remember to to use the Q and A if you have any questions for the end. But uh, but Gemma, you've raised a very good question. Um, what is the app Racky uh, that uh, people can people can get assistance from it, that you were talking it's about? It's called Fuel Gemma? Service. Fuel service, and I'll I'll try and pull out the link to that too. So just give me a couple. Excellent. Of Thank you very much. Um, oh, and Ryan has actually found that Ryan's been busy beavering away. Uh, uh, East Lothian Council supported EV Assist, uh, which is a, an interesting development. Ryan, we will absolutely need to cover that um, when we're talking about uh, Wallyford Park and Choose, which is of course your your flagship hub. Um, but yeah, that's a yeah 
fantastic bit of uh, of information there. And I see, yes, Raki, you've shared you shared in the chat the uh, designability, uh, the website, and the um, you know the, the past eighteen ninety nine. So thank you very much for that. Essential reading for anyone developing either brand new charging infrastructure or um, you know brand new charging hubs or even just individually located charge points. So if if you want simple simple in, uh, information that's on the designability website, it's quite simple and easy to understand. Whereas the PaaS are proper standards, so it's more detailed and it has a lot more information. Probably more to more for more on the technical side has the you know the details around that. Yeah, yeah. And one of the other points that you raised there uh, was to do with um, accessible. There were, there were two points that were, were very important. So one of them was being able to check the state of charge of your car whilst you're away, because for some people, it's not easy to return to the vehicle to, to check that or to return to the charger to check that. Um, and not all vehicles have an app. For example, the Hyundai Ionic is one of the best, no, as opposed to the Ionic 5, which is also brilliant, but the older Ionic is one of the best non-Tesla EVs out there. For, but the, the one thing it's missing is an app and um you know funnily enough my my in-laws have, have got an app uh, sorry uh, uh, an ionic and they 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 were saying at the weekend that they wish it had an app for that very reason and um yeah i'm aware that there is some hardware now there are some public chargers and i believe ian that you have some that can do this uh where there's a QR code on the screen of the charger. So what you'll obviously be at the charger to activate it. You scan that QR code on your phone and it shows you the status of the charging session. So you can then walk or wheel away um, to, to wherever, you know, like the service station, you know, to, to use the lavatory or to, to grab a bite to eat. And you can keep an eye on that from your phone. Uh, which is not an official app. It's almost a kind of web portal that's that's keeping tabs on on what your car's up to. Um, but uh, Ian, am I right in saying that your some of your hardware does that? Yeah, that's right. The the the, the latest uh, the Chem Power hardware we have on our on our high voltage hubs um, offers that, and it's uh, I, I think it it it's the sort of thing that people like yourself and I, Ian, who who uh, geek out on this sort of stuff, we love. But I think actually what we see now is we see more mass market drivers. It's really helpful for people to manage their time at the charge as well and of course it's it's just the beginning in terms of what where we can take things in terms of that kind of in charging session communication to the driver so you don't need to wait by your vehicle anymore um so yeah it's a good start but there's a lot more to come Definitely. Well, that's exciting. And I know that obviously we'll, we'll hopefully see even more um, developments that will make charging easier. And we will come on to that in just a second. But very so, quickly. Um, I just uh, wanted to uh, add something uh, on there in, in terms of the display also needs to be quite accessible. You know, like Ian said, you can have the QR code, but sometimes your um, network doesn't work in some places. And it'll be great if the display, if you could sit in the car and just see it on the display while you're in the car. Uh, you know, if it's nose facing, if you if your nose front, you can still see it. But if you're sort of reverse parked and, you, you know, you can't see some of the display display units aren't so big or the display uh, isn't so big for the customers to see it from the car. And that would be brilliant if you had a good, big display screen, which could allow them to have that. Yeah, really good point that is, yeah, the visibility is 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 important, um, very important. And also, as you say, the height of that screen is, is very simple things. You know, you look, for example, at the, um, in fact, uh, one of the questions that's been uh, submitted to us in advance, I believe, mentions some of the new hardware that ESB eCars is using. And I know that they're probably talking about the Siemens FSX stuff. Um, they're saying that the accessibility of them is worse than the hardware that they replace because the, um, I believe that they'll be referring to the fact that the cables holsters are on one side of the unit and then the screens on the other. So if you're in a wheelchair, it was awkward enough for you to get around to one side of the charger at some of these sites, let alone having to go around the side. And that brings me on to the next point. And I'd love to bring in Ian and Ryan as the infrastructure owners slash operators slash, um, you know, kind of veterans, if you wish. Um, so Raki, you, you raised a, a very important point about pre-authorization and the time it would take for someone with limited mobility to swipe your card and then actually lift the cable, take it round to the socket on the vehicle. And by that point, some of these chargers will have gone, oh, too slow. And by the way, we're keeping your pre-authorization fee. Um, I mean, one could argue that there's a reason that there's a time limit and that's almost like, you know, the the tire machine at the garage. So, you know, if you you, you put your pound in and you, uh, you know, you've, you've done all four tires and then you've got Mr. Skinflint 
me, waiting very patiently, nose to bumper, to get in there to take advantage of the, the leftover time on the on the unit. In this case, it could potentially be tens and tens of pounds of lecky that goes onto your credit card. However, that's not an excuse. So presumably, this is a resolvable issue straight off the top of my head, um, some sort of kind of proximity sensor. So you can tell if a vehicle has left and another one's turned up and you can go, ah, 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 no, you're probably someone else. But uh, Ian and Ryan, any thoughts on the time limits for the, the pre-authorization, you know, between authorizing and, um, and starting the charge and how that can be made more accessible without accidentally resulting in someone pinching someone else's electrons? Who wants to go first? <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I think, uh, go on Ryan, I'll you, sir. Uh, I'll have a shot. So I think one of the biggest issues is <clears throat> actually just people understanding how to use a charger. Um, we, we've tried hard to um, put uh, really good labelling. We've um, stolen some of the best ideas across the industry, like the rest of the industry does. Um, much like, you know, pass either side. Um, I, I stole the idea off Fastnet. I'm not sure they stole it off. Um, but uh, yeah, it's nothing new under the sun. But just making sure that people understand that there's an order to do things. Um, you can do it in different ways, but if you pay, select your outlet, take it out, put it in, press start, then it'll save you coming back and forth to the charger. Um, is that just poor charge point design? Arguably, yes. Um, are we going to get away from a lot of these issues by um, adopting generally plug and charge? You do this once, you tell your car or the charging network who you are because your car knows it, and then you just plug in. Um, yes, um, there's a lot of things that uh, I think scale will resolve. There's a lot of things also that scale will, uh, or the issues that we haven't resolved before we scale will just lead to um, pretty awful situations if um, not resolved. Um, soon um, because only with scale can you start building lovely great filling stations for dc charging with nice big queuing lanes because up to a point you're putting in like osprey started with a couple of chargers here a couple of chargers there to give a nationwide network you couldn't invest in a 16 bay site with a queuing system because it was financially unviable no one was going to do that um so yeah osprey that's right ian <laughs> yeah thanks he's, he's loading um, I, I think uh, I, the point you've made there that's spot on is that, you know, we're, we're, you've got to remember, whilst this is now becoming a mass market, we've been installing these charges now for five, six, seven years. So I think Kate talked about legacy kit earlier, and we were using it then in the context of there's kit out there that really is not reliable or trustworthy. But even the reliable kit we've got, myself and Ryan, we, and we've got some of the same hardware it's that's been in the ground now for five six years it isn't that it's old and therefore not working properly but it's the, it, the design has just moved on the people that designed these charges six seven years ago were engineers in our lab with no market testing um these have not been designed for my ground to come and have a an effortless easy um experience so i think we've people like myself and ryan we spent a lot of time trying to hammer the manufacturers to make these things easier so on the on the question of the 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 handshake, we, we, you know, we worked out eventually that we had to basically remove not only the time limits that were in there, but we also had to remove the order that, that Ryan talked about. So it doesn't matter whether you just pull the connector out and stick it in or do your card first or vice versa. So we're, we're taking these learnings back to the manufacturers and saying, you know, guys, please, can you make it easier for our drivers? But it's, um, look, it's a slow process and the, the, the little... UK, it's not easy for us to influence what is a global manufacturing market. I think what you're seeing now with the likes of, of Kempower, Tritium, Alpatronic is you're seeing a number of the man, a number of the charging networks are all choosing those manufacturers who are making the kit that's easiest to use. So that's great. But it really comes back to this issue of the fact that there's 6,000 rapid charges in the UK. I think between around 2,000 of those are what we class as legacy. So they're not charges that any of us would recommend our friends go and use but the great news is that you know, by the end of this year we'll have nine ten thousand so that legacy bit is going to become smaller and smaller and smaller which means that if you if you were to leave the house and randomly approach a charger you've got a much greater chance of hitting an easy to use reliable uh accessible charger so you know a lot of the stuff that's out there because the infrastructure is so scarce it's still legacy, which is a problem. But the new stuff that's going in, the new hubs that Brian talks about, it's easy to use, it's much more accessible, and the, the hardware itself 
is is a lot simpler to use as well. Any small Super. game, for example, we spent um, five, six years building from, I think we went from 12 to 4 to 44 to 114. We'll soon probably be, well, we will be at 214, probably soon three, 400. Um, of those 23 are 50 kilowatt or above journey chargers, Ian has four um, in addition to those. But I expect within a year, there'll be, um, what's that, 30? There'll be 60 chargers in the ground and they'll range up to Ionity 350 kilowatts. So, kind of, you know, overnight, um, all my stuff, um, all my DC stuff kind of becomes legacy chargers of last resort. Um, and it's, it's amazing the, the, the pace of change and some of the really good designs that are coming forward. Absolutely. And um, just whilst we were having that conversation, uh, Marcus Clifford asked a very good question um, about rapid chargers and pre-authorization. Uh, can you not just plug in the car first, then do the swiping, etc.? But as others have pointed out, it does depend on the type of charger. Some of them will only release the plug from the holster when it's been pre-authorized, which has its advantages because if it's um, you know a, a, a site that's kind of in a dimly lit corner of a car park and it's where we Neds like to come along and then, you know, if it was a loose cable, they'd be like, oh, let's smash it. And we've seen that happen before. So um, the fact that it holds on to the valuable stuff until you tell it, I am a legitimate user of this. And they go, OK, well, you can have this then. But then we come up against the issue of the time limits, etc. But good to hear that, yeah, generally speaking, the new infrastructure that's, that's going in has been designed with... Um, you know, with, with accessibility in mind, with ease of use in mind, user friendliness, whether you are able bodied or, or, or not, if you've got kind of limitations to your mobility, etc. Um, because generally speaking, the ones who are thinking along those lines are the ones who are also putting effort into making their stuff robust, reliable and long lasting. So it's, it's a win win. Um, now, before we, we go on to I speak, I was going to add oh, one sorry, yeah, more Ricky. point, Ian, just for um, Ian and Ryan to ask them actually, um, in terms of free authorization, you know, with current uh, uh, ICE vehicles, we don't, there's a drawdown. So you, you if you're paying at the uh, pump, you put your card in and it takes, it says that's the amount you've got to use and it draws down. Why, and I, um, uh, apologies for my ignorance, why can't EV charging be similar, which allows for, at least getting rid of one aspect, which is pre-authorization. Right. And then, you know, then the handshake obviously needs to be more clearer. Great question. Yeah, so the, so it, it comes down to um, kind of debit and credit card legislation. So the, the, the boring technical answer is that because uh, many uh, f traditional fuel transactions are deemed as manned transactions because there's a human in the shop, uh, and it therefore has its own transaction code in payments world, which means you can have up to a hundred pound payment. Uh, EV charging currently doesn't have its own transaction type and therefore we're all deemed as unmanned transactions. Uh, and there's certain legisl legislative um, breaks on that. So you'll see, you've seen the charging networks now playing around with their pre-authorization pre level. So we, we took ours down from 30 pound to a pound. Uh, unfortunately, you know, we're dealing with the great British public here. There are people out there who try to game the system. They will uh, use cards like Revolut cards and things that don't have enough money on them. So we, we've had, we, the CPOs, have had some quite big issues, especially with certain taxi driving firms uh, taking thousands and thousands of pounds of free charges. So the pre off fees are unfortunately required. You know, we're trying to, we've had horror stories of drivers who, for some reason where they can't charge, end up with £120 set in their card. It, it, it's a, it's a real issue because we're seeing more and more of these challenger banks, you know, the Revoluts, the, the I forget the other names, but, um, and they work very differently to, to a HSBC or to a Visa. So we're, we're, we're learning as much as we can about how payments work. It's a, it's a new field, but our, our aim is that you should never see the pre-auth, you know, by the time you, you, you connect, put the charger, put the connector back in the charger and you walk away you should get the the app, uh, the payment status on your phone. This is the other issue as well, is that most of us now, we do get alerts as soon as there's a transaction taken from our account. In the old days, you'd see it on your statement three weeks later. So I think we're all a lot more aware now of the pre-auth being returned, not being returned and the delay. But look, we, we spend many management meetings a week talking about it, and it's a big focus. Thank you very kindly. Uh, and on that note, we can bring up uh, poll three. 
uh, for the evening before heading on to looking at an example of a um, a charge, you know, an actual charge point that's been designed from the ground up with accessibility in mind. So, Donald, the third poll is: Would you be more inclined to use or actively search for a charging location that's ranked as safe and accessible by an independent organisation or other users as well? Um, so, you know, whether it's from a, a point of view of um, you know travelling alone at night, personal safety, or whether it's from a point of view of you know, you, you need to make sure that a bay will be wide enough, that a, a charge point will be easy to use, cable will be easy to lift, that it will actually, you know, the holster will let go of it, etc. So, Donald, once everyone's uh, given their answers, we'll, we'll have a look at the results of that. But um, I'd at this point like to bring in Claire, uh, before we look at sort of whole sites that are designed from an accessibility perspective. Um, we've, we've got Claire, obviously you're from Urban Foresight and you were heavily involved in uh, a very interesting accessibility charge point project. But if you give us a quick bit of background on Urban Foresight, who they are, and then we can have a talk about the Dooku project. Uh, but actually, it looks like the poll results are just about to come up, unless they maybe did already whilst I was... Oh, no, there we go. Um, yeah, so that is a resounding uh, yes in favour of the good work of the likes of Charge Safe. So you'll be pleased to see that, Kate. Um, yeah, 94% are far more inclined to say um, that they would, you know, they would actually look to see if this if this location is safe and and accessible, and uh, the other six percent are uh, are prepared to, are prepared to have the, the the worst that the dimly lit corner of the car park can throw at them. But um, yeah, Claire, sorry, uh, great to, great to have you on. Uh, but uh, yeah, tell us more about Urban Foresight and the Duku projects. And I believe you've got a couple of uh, of of illustrations of of, of what the Duku uh, charge point yeah. is. I think people prefer to look at pictures than listen to me talk. So I've got a couple of couple of images. Um, Urban Foresight, we're a consultancy. We're based in Dundee and Newcastle. Um, and I work in the electric mobility team, um, which is headed up by Gary McRae, who, along with Fraser Crichton, was sort of the, the leaders in Dundee and sort of installing all of the EV infrastructure that Dundee now has. Um, we look, or sort of my team very much looks at... Um, innovation around electric mobility so it's not just evs it's electric um it's e-bikes it's scooters um but we focus very much on accessibility and equity as well um and how you can make the transition to sustainable transport equitable and fair for everybody um so that, that's pretty much sort of the the approach that we take to everything um and when we first started looking at sort of the accessibility of ev charge points um i think we were really really shocked at the the disparity between the user experience for a disabled person and a non-disabled person. Um, it was quite, quite shocking, really. Um, so if, if you're happy for me to, I'll just Please I'll do. see yeah, if my, my technology works. You never know what could happen next. Um, it may work, it may not work. Can everyone see that? I'm pretty sure yeah, you can yeah, that's, that's see all of the slides that are coming up as well. <laughs> So just to sort of really sort of demonstrate what the problem is, there's, there's over 14 million people in the UK with a disability. You know, I'm one of them. Um, I had a brain injury and an accident about six years ago. Um, so sort of I'm very, very passionate about, about accessibility and equity and fairness. Um, we did a survey about, oh gosh, it must've been about two and a half, three years ago across Scotland. And what we found was that up to 99% of public charging hubs weren't accessible to people with a range of disabilities and that's not just people who use wheelchairs that's people with um upper body upper body mobility issues that's people with cognitive impairments that's people with visual impairments that's people with hearing impairments it's a huge range of people it's people who as, as they're getting older have got arthritis people who've had strokes um so it, it you know it's not just people tend to think when they think of um, people with disabilities they automatically think of people in wheelchairs it's not it's a much much wider problem than that and so just in case anybody sort of hasn't really seen what this can look like so these are just a couple of examples um not from, not um both from scotland so the difference between so the user experience here of the disabled and non-disabled motorists is is quite you know it's quite stark um both of these charge points are significant barriers to charging. There's curbs. There's actually a fence in the one on the left in front of the, the charge point. There's steps. There's bollards um, that stop people who are using wheelchairs getting anywhere near the charge points. 
The screens are too high to read. The spaces are narrow. Um, so if there's a car park next to you, you can't get out of your car. You can't get your mobility equipment out of your car. Um, and then just, you know, that, that picture in the right, there's so much clutter. Even if you could manage to get up onto that curb, you haven't got a hope of getting near the screen or near the, near the socket. Um, and I think sadly, these are really, really common problems. Um, but it, does, it really doesn't take much planning to change that at all. So you said about sort of the projects that we've been working on. So this is Dundee's fourth hub. Um, so we worked really, really closely with Dundee City Council and SWACO on this. And basically what we've done is we have taken out all of the bollards. There's no bollards. There's no curbs. Um, the, the site is entirely flat. Every single space is blue badge size space. Um, there's safe and wide access around the site, but also to and from the site for wheelchair users. There's really good levels of light. Um, there's shelter for people because if you're disabled, it can take you longer to charge, so you're exposed to the elements more. Um, there's cable management systems. Um, the cables themselves are sleeved in really, really bright colors. So that if you have visual impairments, um, you can see them on the ground. Um, the site isn't perfect, I think, like a lot of organizations, you know, we're, we're working towards sort of getting better and it's a learning curve for us. So we've got more to do. We want to put in some rest stops for people. Um, we're improving the accessible signage across the whole of the city. Um, we want to put in a WAV bay um, at the end. And I think like a lot of um, councils, it's that kind of conversation with different teams within the council, because by putting in a WAV bay, we, we lose another space. So it's that, that sort of conversation with the parking team and, and the impact that that has on the income for the council. You know, we want to put um, videos and um, information on the website so that people can look at that and understand what the user experience is before they go um, so that they can sort of reduce some of the anxiety that people go when they're doing something, for, trying something for sort of the first time. And I think we, we really see this site as a, it's a step change really for the way in which sort of local authorities and installers work together um, to develop and deliver charge points. Um, it's got accessibility really at its core. And if you ask SWACO about costs, they tell you it didn't cost any more than delivering a normal site. It just takes a little bit of forethought to do it and plan it well. Um, and you touched on sort of the idea of the accessible charge points. So this is the charge point that we've been working on with a design company called Dooku. Um, it has been designed all the way through with people with disabilities. Um, every single decision we made was in collaboration with people with disabilities. It um, has an integrated cable management system that takes the weight of the cable. The automated cable reel allows one-handed operation. It's collision resistant, so there's no need for bollards. Um, it's got height adjustable socket and screens. It can be tap to pay or app. It's got an audio loop. It's got visual prompts um, and just sort of simple things like the display is designed for people with color blindness and cognitive challenges. So every single thing that we could design into this has been designed into it. And again, it's, it's just thinking about it and working with people who have a very different user experience to other people to make sure that these things are thought through. And what you end up with is a product that is better for everybody. It's not just better for people with disabilities, it's better for everybody. You know, no one wants to be picking up a cable that's dirty, covered in, in mud and trailing it all over their clothes or carrying it in their lap if they're using a wheelchair. You know, it's, it's better for everyone. And then the other thing that we've been working on is sort of refer to those sort of legacy sites. And this is a very, very rough image here, a sort of very early prototype. Um, it's a boot mounted automated cable reel. Um, so again, it takes some of the technology from the, um, the charge point to enable us to have one handed control over a cable reel. The reel, reel mount itself takes the majority of the weight of the cable um, and it automate, automatically sort of reels it out and then reels it back in again, just making it an easier process and cleaner as well. So they, those were sort of the pictures that I wanted to, to show. I'm not sure now how to stop sharing. I'll never go. Oh. <laughs> no, honestly, yeah, that, is, that is absolutely <laughs> brilliant. I mean, that you know, having that that kind of visual um, mm. indication of how to design a hub properly and how to design um, a piece of a hard, you know, a charging hardware mm. properly as well. Um, you, know, you 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 have properly thought of everything. 
Um, I think one of the, actually, uh, Gemma has asked if you can share those slides uh, mm -hmm. with, at least with Gemma, potentially with other attendees yeah. as well. Because, yeah, and I did see the Dooku Charge Point at the London mm. EV show, if I recall correctly. And um, I remember that it was it was shared in, actually, we'll bring in Heather very quickly, and I'm acutely aware of time. We will need to, to move on very shortly. But in the Scottish EV Drivers Club, I seem to recall Dooku being shown and uh, actually kind of laughed out the room because of the cost of it, et cetera, which unintentionally mm. was EV drivers who've never had to consider these, these things before being ableist. Uh, mm. Do you remember that, Heather? Yeah. Um, oh, no, oh, fair enough. <laughs> fair enough. Um, uh, but uh, yeah, it, it, it was the same with like uh, a bunch of other EV driver groups. Mm. It wasn't just Scottish EV Drivers Club. Mm. And anyone who, anyone who kind of follows the UK-wide EV driver groups knows that Scottish EV Drivers mm. Club is generally the friendliest and the most progressive. So, um, yeah, because there's, there's, there's a lot of whinging mm. on some of them. There's a lot of whinging, but the <laughs> Scottish EV drivers is friendly. But the point is that, um, yeah, uh, honestly, I, I, I saw that and thought, but you, you don't know the story. The people mm. are saying, oh, you know, it's an overpriced electrical garden hose and all of this, because obviously that was designed for mm. um, the one they were showing was for home use. But you've shown mm. it in its public guise where it yeah. absolutely has value. It has purpose. And it also has purpose as a home unit for people who have these same mobility issues, etc. Exactly. So, yeah, and I um, think it's it's like all new technology. It's sometimes it's expensive because you've got the R&D behind it. But as time goes on, you manufacture more units, you get better, you do value engineering, price comes down. It's the same with any new technology. You know, you think how expensive were iPods when they first came out? You know, how expensive were iPhones? Um, yeah. You know, the price always, always comes down. Um, and I think, you know, with with the cable reel that, that we just looked at, we've just got a third round of, of funding from Transport Scotland and to, to develop that and, to, and take that to market. And I think... Part of that is going to be looking at why we keep getting these barriers. You know, we know what the barriers are, but why do they keep happening? So we're going to be working with local authorities sort of across Scotland to sort of really examine why they happen and, you know, how we can get around that. And then how we can um, manage that conversation with the local authorities um, and not not the sort of same as what Kate's doing, but look at how we can work around a system where we can provide um, people with disabilities with the information that they need before going to a site so that they can understand because so many disabilities are so different you can't you can't pigeonhole them and say this is an accessible site because it may be very accessible for one person not accessible for another so it's like how how do we communicate that as well so that that's something that Transport Scotland have asked us to look at. Awesome. I'm glad that's been looked into, actually. That's a really good point. Um, I am acutely aware that we do have a hard stop in 20 minutes time and we've got a fair chunk to get through that's very important and relevant to this. So on that note, examples of excellent accessible charging infrastructure design. Um, we'll go with Osprey first. Ian, obviously the Paisley Pair Charging Hub that you worked very closely with Kate at ChargeSafe um, to design. Tell us more. And indeed, if you happen to have a, a, a slide of it, feel free to throw that on the screen. I've probably just surprised you with that one. But uh, no, Paisley yeah, Pair, you, you've obviously, you've, you've gone properly gone for it in terms of the, the, the design of that from an accessibility perspective. Uh, likewise, uh, Ryan, if you've got one of Wallyford, have that ready to go so that we can can talk through what you've done but if we can have, have a sort of two-ish minute uh pitch of of what osprey has done and is doing on accessibility and then we'll we'll do the same for for east lothian as a, an example of best practice within local authorities um yeah i think that ultimately the job of a, of a charging network is to to make in the future you've got to imagine a world where you you approach a roundabout and there's four great charging hubs that were reliable with lots of high power chargers on so how then do we make you choose to drive into our site than, than one of the competitors? So we need to make a site as inviting and as easy to use as possible. So it's in our interest to, to always build the best sites in the country. So it looked great to be awarded and recognised by ChargeSafe for the Paisley Pair. But as, as Kate has hinted, we've got another site opening in Essex near the N25 in a few weeks that will be the best site in the country again. And then the site that we're building in Devon, uh, will be that. So, it, you know, it, it, it's a great thing for EV drivers that you have the charger networks competing against each other um, to try and always build the best site. The, the problem we've got is if you look at the, what was in the press on the weekend about there's just simply not enough chargers uh, over, Chris, over the Christmas period. This is the challenge is if we are, if we had a, uh, you know, a square of land, would you rather us build eight 
beautiful, well-lit, accessible, safe bays or, or 16 charges. And it's that conundrum which is causing issues. I, I saw a hub that was launched um, at a drive through coffee place earlier this week where you had six chargers with no lighting packed in together. And this is the problem. We, we all want thousands of chargers, but actually what we really want is for them to be lit, safe, reliable with, with the right instructions. So I think we... You, you, you're great that we have ourselves and fast and others who are raising the bar because eventually people will people thank you Ian, for, for helping me out there thank you so, Ryan, you know, for we, poising yourself yeah, <laughs> yeah. so i think you know it, it it's it's a good start we're, we're certainly not not finished yet um clearly we would have loved to have had a canopy with lighting here at this site but the grand conditions didn't allow it allow it the other thing which is a big factor is that when you look at the networks like uh osprey fastnet you know grid serve instable others it, it's Apart from the big hubs like Norwich, like Braintree, like our one in Devon, in many cases, we're building on other people's land where we're not in control. So we need the likes of Marston's, McDonald's and these guys to say, yes, we, we understand it. You've educated us. Let's build something the drivers want for the future. So look, there's so much more work to do, but it's about convincing. It's either you buy the land, as we've done in Devon, and then you're in complete control. So there we can have drive-in bays. We can have long bays. We can remove every curb in the site. Or you need a great relationship with your landlord or with the local authority to give you the space. I mean, you, you can see from this image very clearly how many spaces we had to take out of use to create an eight-bay charging hub. And these are the sorts of commercial issues that are a lot tougher when it comes to places like retail parks. But when you think about a city centre, um, we've got uh, you know we've got ten quite inaccessible charges right in Cardiff city centre. Uh, to make them accessible would have taken a, a mammoth bit of kind of civil engineering from this, the city council, but it's where we need to get people to. So look, it's it's good that we're raising the bar. Um, you know, and Kate says to me that that uh grids of Norwich is the the safest site. Well then great, let's let's take the bar even higher. Let's keep going. So that's that's what we've got to keep doing. But um look good good to have examples of what good looks like. But they they are in the minority today because the charging networks are not in control of the land. So what we need is public pressure, media pressure on the landlords and on the local authorities to to say, look, guys, if you want to play in charging, you need to do it like this. Otherwise, we're not going to accept it. And what I'd love to see, we all love the ZapMap survey. What I'd love to see is a survey that ranks Marston's against Morrison's against uh, McDonald's against East Lothian. And then, then we'll see, right, who really deserves the praise. So yeah, in other words, charge safe. This is this is going to be the golden opportunity straight away. Absolutely, um, and yeah, great to see the, the the genuine commitment to this as well. Um, oh, yeah. Very quickly, Ryan, let's have a look at uh, well, presumably it'll be Wallyford you'll want to talk about um, because that is a, a revolutionary site. Oh no, hang on, of course, yeah. So we're starting humble, are we? Yeah, let's let's have a look at this. This is where the real class is. You know, it's not in the big flashy hub. Sorry, yeah. it's um, you know all the stuff that surrounds that, the whole ecosystem that all has to be um, equitably distributed. Uh, there needs to be accessibility, you know, baked in there. So these kind of like humble sites in a village, you know, it's the only chargers in the village. Um, it's twenty five percent is is um, restricted to blue badge holders. Over provision, possibly, but a lot of people can actually charge at home. So you actually need maybe more of a provision in the AC on and off street um, locations with a public charging. But uh, yeah, I can go around this thing that's come up on my screen. Uh, so here's uh, what you probably want, want to see is Wallyford Park and Choose. Uh, so it's a big site, um, a park and ride site. We call it Park and Choose because um, it's a multimodal site, you can choose how to continue your multimodal journey onward. Um, in the middle of it, it's got uh, these two 12 meter long bays, which can take caravans, you know, horse boxes, if you're um, into that. Um, it can take big vans, small vans, multiple vans. And uh, I think this, this uh, oh, and it can take big buses as well. Uh, hopefully you can see all these. Um, but uh, it was really designed for, for um, uh, serving people with um, special um, special vehicles uh, who are traveling into the um, Edinburgh city and their upcoming low emission zone um, where they maybe had to further trade carry a 
dual axle trailer or they just had a long wheelbase van so they needed somewhere long they could charge um also needed um uh, outlets they could uh, reach to strange positions a lot of people put down let's in b positions which introduces lots of problems at the time and um, there wasn't uh chem power um, big wibbly arm chargers on the market um this was maybe about two almost three years ago now if they had would have bought them instead um, there are similar models in the market now, like Alpatronic with really nice hinge arms that come out. Um, so these were some of the best at the time. Um, but the market always moves on. And it was really easy to design this site um, around what people um, had, had told us, you know, just space around charges. So all those hatched rest areas are at least 1.2 metres. There's nowhere in that site that isn't 1.2 metres. Now, yeah, the trailing leads are a problem. Uh, we will hopefully retrofit some kind of cable um, support arms to these chargers. If not, we'll probably retire them into a fleet context and replace them with something like a chem power or something um, more accessible because this site, you know, um, has you and as it does put it on a pedestal. And uh, yeah, um, when Kate does rank everybody, we want to be Ian. Uh, yep. <laughs> So, amazing yeah Ar articulate as always and just you know the fact that you're thinking like five steps ahead is is superb um there's been one very quick question that's come in uh marcus has been asking some brilliant questions tonight so the initial i believe this was about the initial photograph of the type two posts the destination charging posts um so hang on a minute uh yeah where there was a bay marked as disabled, is that priority for disabled or only for disabled? Because this has been a debate amongst EV drivers. If all disabled. the bays apart from the disabled, so it's pure disabled. If you are able, but if you don't have a blue badge, but you do have an EV, you'll get fined for parking in it and using the charge point because you're not disabled or you know, registered as such. The blue badge, I don't think, will allow you to contravene the other part of the. Yeah, you have to be charging. Entry. You need to be plugged in. TRO says you need to be plugged in. Um, and the also will say shortly that you need to have, have a blue badge. So it is, it is both. Sorry, that's not clear. Yeah. Um, yeah. A lot of people um, back in the dark days, of, of the early days of um, uh, public infrastructure, would put chargers in disabled bays for some reason, because it was like a speciality parking bay. Um, yeah. Um, now there is enough demand um, to, to put... Um, significant numbers of ch charges in a car park when you do that if you don't make them all accessible then you should make a percentage accessible um, i'm much in favor of making everything accessible because it's um uh, it doesn't create any st stigma um and it's also really quite luxurious you know it feels like a high quality um site so if you've got uh, maybe a network a that has quite small 2.4 maybe 2.5 wide beds um and you've got Network B, which has nice uh, wide, kids can get out the door, swing them open. Uh, you, you might choose to go there. Um, mm. And it also, you know, is great for accessibility. Well, I'll tell you what, I'm something of a, a technophobe when it comes to Zoom, but I've just figured out how to use the reactions. There you go. That's well earned that wee round of applause there, because genuinely you've just thought this through. And I know that there's a lot of people who would have felt um, and, and physically been excluded from EV charging if they didn't beat the able-bodied person to the disabled base. So you've, you've, you've just made sure that that is there for people who genuinely need it for and their EV and their mobility requirements. And we want to make sure that other people who require planning permission they slowly and also meet the now very clear guidance it's not uh, you know regulation it's not the law it is guidance but uh, we will be expecting them to show why it's re uh, not reasonable in design terms not cost terms design terms to meet that guidance because uh, infrastructure has to be fit for the 21st century for all for a just transition you could actually well, you're, hear you're in, oh, sorry yeah yeah it, 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 that is that's the best thing that's been said all night because imagine if every local authority did that so every new drive-through coffee shop retail park that goes in they want EV charges if the planners say the bays have to be accessible. The retail park has no say in this. It means that anything that goes in for EV will be, I mean, that, that is what we need across the country. Done. Yeah. That's, that's the way it should be. Annoyingly, uh, we we haven't found the technology to clone Ryan and put him in all the local authorities yet. You know, there are some amazing local authorities. We've obviously got Ryan, we've got Fraser in Dundee. Come on, now mm -hmm. kiss makeup um but we've also got like paul gambrell down in, in oxfordshire but you've got the likes of inverclyde council who of course i've given a very special mention before who will just be sitting there just now just like what 
you know, they won't care. Um, and that's the really frustrating thing. We need local authorities to care. We need that planning permission to be in place. They, did, they don't necessarily need to pay for that infrastructure. As you've said, it's planning permission. There's other people with lots of money want to build stuff like shopping centres and, and housing estates. And if, if they want to do that, they need to meet these criteria, which includes, you know, accessibility for everyone and decarbonisation for everyone. But um, now on to... Uh, well, basically the, the the highlight of the evening, um, we get to cross-examine the FASTER project because now Gemma is going to show us what the FASTER project is doing with regards to accessibility in Scotland. We've got about five minutes left to cover this, unfortunately. We're, we're running out of time, but I would love to get the feedback from Raki. I'd love to get the feedback from Kate about the accessibility. Have you, have you got the, the like a, a blueprint ready to show us, Gemma, perchance? Uh, I do uh, this was um, I was going to go through a little bit of of kind of what we've done on accessibility, but I'll start with the the blueprint. Um, bear with me a sec. So this was. Oh, can you see that? Oh, hang on, it's loading now. There we go. Yep, can see it now. Um, so sorry, bear with me a sec. Apologies for so, leaving you with very little time on this, but. That's okay. So um, this was um, done as a, a kind of universal bay design. We we touched base with a lot of people actually who are on this call today, um, motability and designability on their research and design guidance. I've spoken to Claire um, about procurement um, and we, we ended up looking at it a universal bay design. So um, as has already been mentioned, um, blue badge holders, I think at my last count were, were two million, but there's 14 million disabled drivers. Um, so to, to try and cater for um, more than blue badge holders, um, but also like you say, uh, vehicle accessibility as well. And Transport Scotland, who are a match funder on this project, asked us to consider van um, charging as well. So what we did was look at the um, disabled parking guidance at the time because the PAS guidance wasn't ex in existence when we were looking at this. Um, and we extended the um, charging bay to make it long enough for a van um, and then put access strips down both sides um, so that if you were someone with a modified car and you needed access on three sides, you still had it as per that diagram on the top left. Um, but if you were a van, you could also still um, access the charging facilities. Um, we also looked at um, dropping the, the curbs for each of the sites. And this is very much an ideal scenario. And when we try and apply it to each site it's not it doesn't necessarily work for every site particularly as on the faster project um, we're not looking at big hubs um, quite a lot of the sites we're looking at only have the utilization for maybe one or two charges so space um, can be limited and um, the demand in that car park is also quite high so as um, Ian from Osprey mentioned there are kind of um, considerations that are, are kind of conflicting and you, it's a constant kind of balancing act of, of getting the, the best outcome that you can achieve the most that you can. Um, sorry, it's a bit of a whistle stop. Um, we did go out to procurement recently with 10 design considerations from um, based on Urban Foresight's recommendation actually. Um, and that covered things from cable management to socket access. Um, we couldn't obviously award solely on that, um, but it was a, a heavily weighted part of the procurement um, and came into the decision making process as well. Um, I think just in terms of lessons that we've learned on faster, I'd say consider space early. Um, when you look at the um, design guidance, uh, the PAS guidance now is looking at um, access all on all four sides of the vehicle. And if you put that into a car park, that's then taking up four standard parking spaces. So it does need planning very early. Um, 
I would say, <laughs> um, again, I think Ian mentioned this, if, if buyers start to ask about accessibility, um, then suppliers will come under demand to um, start providing it. Um, so we've definitely got a big voice that will make a difference here. Um, we would love for all bays to be accessible, but it's not always possible with site and budget constraints. Um, and if that's the case, then I guess following on, if all the network can't be accessible, we need kind of better listings of accessible charging um, facilities. And um, again, Kate's work's really important in that. Um, I know there's some work with ZapMap going on um, to try and list accessible sites as well. And then I think finally, oh no, have I got time to share a quick photo? Yeah, go for it. We've still got a couple of minutes left. I can let you show so, it. There's been a bit of chat today about how, um, you know, things have changed um, in the last few years. And this is a photo <laughs> um, just to show you how far I guess we've come in the last few years. Just a um, quick heads up, we can still see the PowerPoint. I don't know if you were sharing a particular window oh, as opposed to the full screen. So, yeah, if you. Let me. That's the one. No, we, we, we can still see the power. Oh, hang on, there we go. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, thank you. So this is it. an example of a site. It's about seven years old. Um, and you can see there's a charger on um, on a raised curb with a bollard right in front of it. Very, very inaccessible. And I can only share this because obviously um, in the background is a Swarco charger and Claire has um, showed us a very good recent hub designed with Swarco. Um, very recently, so I'm, I'm happy to share this. It's actually a site that this charger will be pulled out before faster install at this site. So we're obviously hoping to make this one a lot more accessible, but I thought it was just a nice way to end and show how far we've come, what a difference it is talking about this um, and that there's still loads to do, but we are making progress. That is proper eye-opening, I and mean, that looks like something out of Jurassic Park. That with all the kind of ferns and things growing out of it. I did, uh, whereabouts is that one actually? But, um, I'm not going to share uh, about you. No, and... I'm not. But um, well, unfortunately, we are now at the um, the end of proceedings. But there's, there's a, I just want to very quickly rattle through a little bit, a couple of bits of the Q and A. Um, so Greta had actually raised a really good point. Of course, this is a, a, a webinar about accessibility and inclusivity. Um, you know, had we engaged with interpreters, sign language interpreters uh, ahead of this evening and I'm, I'm going to be honest and say no that was an oversight certainly on, on on my part and that's a really good question and Donald I don't know if that's something that we can uh, factor in for future webinars um, either at the end of this series or, or the start of the next one um, because that's a really good point in terms of making this accessible to everyone, that would be a great shout. And although it's not sign language, it is worth pointing out that um, we, we will be sharing the uh, the transcript of the the chat um, at the end of the, the webinar as well. We we normally capture that, and also a participant has enabled closed captioning, um, which will, will hopefully go some way to um, you know allowing the uh, more accessibility for for the the deaf community. So apologies about the lack of of sign language interpretation this evening. And um, there was a, a good question from Jackie as well on the wider kind of EV topic, but it was um, it, looking at, at, at people who are are blind, um, and you know as a as a pedestrian dealing with the, um, the you know the, the terrors of people on electric scooters on the pavement and things like that that are causing issues um evs are obviously fairly quiet some of them have the option to override the the, the kind of low speed noise system um you know can there be more sounds for for these cars uh where there's um uh, than when there's a, a charging port uh, uh sorry also then where these charging ports are are they safe for blind people i.e would they be a trip hazard so in terms of the cars, that's annoyingly, you know, in terms of the people we have on the, the panel session tonight, I don't think it's unfortunately within our um, our, our power to be able to, to change this. But certainly government wide uh, remits and the like EU and, and US remits, etc. generally say there does need to be a, a, a low speed warning noise until the tire speed becomes um, you know fast enough and loud enough that, that you can hear the car coming anyway. Um, it's worth pointing out that some EVs are actually quite audible to hear from a distance. My party piece 
places I can pick out a Nissan Leaf coming from 100 metres behind me in a busy city centre because it makes a very distinct artificial noise. Um, so, you know, there, there are other EVs that have different artificial noises and it would be important to make sure that they are audible, um, but not to the point of ruining the one of the, the party pieces of electric vehicles, which is making city centres less overwhelmingly noisy and making them more tranquil but still audible you know from it from a distance um compare that to my 1999 peugeot 106 electric that has no pedestrian warning noise whatsoever that thing is perfect for sneaking about because uh, that does sneak up on people in car parks and so on that is quite eye-opening you compare it to um you know the likes of the leaf that does make that noise and as you're driving along at low speed people go oh oh yeah and they get out of the way in like a, a shop car park or similar but in terms of charging infrastructure um in terms of the not being a trip hazard we've we've discussed to an extent cable management this evening but i'm going to give a shout out to trojan energy who've designed their on-street charge point um in conjunction with uh, disability groups including people with limited uh, vision uh, or, or, or visual impairments so they've actually designed these very slender on street charge points with diffused down lighting so anyone who has perfect vision would automatically think oh you want it to be a massive bright garish light in your face no apparently according to um, groups of people with with uh, you know, um, you know uh, visual impairments you want diffused down light because that's the most easy kind of form of light to to perceive with whatever vision you may have um, and also should you accidentally walk into it one it's kind of hard up against the curb and it's very very slender so the odds of being that close to the curb are hopefully touch wood quite slim but two it also has a bit of give in it so you know it's forgiving if you do accidentally kind of wander into it it's not just a solid bollard that you're just going to fly straight over so um you know, increasingly uh, between the likes of Trojan Energy, the likes of Dooku and, and the, the obviously the hub designs that we've been talking about today um, in terms of their cable management, we are starting to see uh, the issue of visual impairment and, and trip hazards and, and not being able to see something lying on the ground. Claire, you mentioned the conventional Swarco rapid chargers with highly visible cables for that reason. These things are starting to be taken into consideration. Um, and on that note, I'm afraid uh, we are out of time. Um, but there, yeah, there's been some really good questions, which I see that our panellists have been answering in, in the background. So thank you so much for that. Um, actually, yeah, I think, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, congratulations to Ryan, who's been ploughing through them all. I'm just checking that now. But um, honestly, uh, thank you to all of our panellists this evening. Uh, so once again, uh, we uh, thank you to Ian Johnson, Racky Jane, uh, Ryan Robertson, Gemma Robertson, Heather Kennedy, Claire Pennington and Kate Tyrrell. You are all doing incredible work um, to, to improve accessibility and inclusivity in EV charging infrastructure. And we are nowhere near done yet. And it's great to see that the FASTER project is, is taking this into serious consideration with the help of the likes of uh, the brilliant Urban Foresight and, and their experts expertise there. So we will be back uh, towards the end of February. Uh, I should really have the date in front of me, but I've uh, unfortunately been so focused on this that I forgot to double check, but it is towards the end of February. We're going to be talking about the environmental impact of EVs from the manufacturing of, well, sorry, from the extraction of raw materials right through to their recycling. Are they as green as they're cracked up to be? Spoiler alert, yeah, they're actually pretty good, but we're going to talk to some experts who are going to prove that. So in the meantime, thank you for joining us. Thank you for all of your engagement in the chat and uh, some brilliant questions there. And again, you know, it's, it's been a real education for myself as well. It, uh, as someone who is, you know, able-bodied and so on, the, the comments that have been made about how to make the, the webinars more accessible as well as EV infrastructure have been very much appreciated. So thank you for that. Thank you, everyone. Uh, I'll let you run now because we are over, over the time limit, but have a great evening evening and we'll see you again next month.